Welcome to episode 38 of Therese Talk. I'm your host, Therese Main. By day, I co-host a morning radio show on a network in New York and Pennsylvania. By night, I'm a podcaster. If you're a woman like me who loves Jesus and just wants to serve her family and community a little better, you're in the right place. Would you take a moment right now and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode? So when I say the words biblical theology, what comes to mind? Maybe stacks of dusty old books and scholars hunched over the table toiling by candlelight. But what if biblical theology was just a way to make the scripture come alive, to help you understand it more completely so that you grow even closer in your relationship with Jesus? Nancy Guthrie is an author and a Bible teacher who'll be spending this fall helping women all across America learn how to study the Bible better. And if I'm honest right now, I'm a little bit overwhelmed with the idea that you're a biblical theologist. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, don't be. Don't okay. be. I mean, it's a, it sounds like an intimidating term, and it just doesn't have to be. Is it like eating an elephant, just one bite at a time? That, that word theology, I think, because we think of that as being a very academic study, I, I think that maybe intimidates us. But, you know, really, theology is just the study of God. And so anyone who says they're interested in God, anyone who says, I love Jesus, they're already doing theology because you're thinking about who is he? If you love him, you're thinking about who is he? Now, that term biblical theology, there is a bit of technical stuff to it. I mean, there, there's all different kinds of theology. There is historical theology, which is simply the study of what people have believed throughout history about God. Uh, there would be systematic theology. And I think that's what most of us are used to if we've studied any kind of doctrine. Because because when we've done that, we have looked at what does the Bible have to say about sin, about judgment, about holiness or whatever, All right. So what biblical theology is, biblical theology recognizes that the story over the course of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation tells one cohesive story about what God is doing in the world through Christ. And it also recognizes that the divine author of this book, the Bible, has written into his book a number of significant themes. And that when we understand these themes and we see how they develop through the story of the Bible, it helps us to get the message that the divine author intends for us to get. So this idea of biblical theology, it's simply the study, understanding the Bible as one story and what the major themes are of the Bible. So basically, we just have to learn everything about the Bible and then we'll be all set and ready to go. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's the goal of our lives, isn't it? It is. It, 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 right. I mean, I, I, I sometimes say, you know, I've been doing these biblical theology workshops for women around the country and, and I open it up to Q&A and, you know, a woman will stand up and I so get this. She'll just like, it can seem kind of overwhelming. Like, you know, how am I ever going to get all of this? And it reminds me of when I first got serious about Bible study a number of years ago. And I was in this Bible study and I remember just looking around and there were women who seemed to know where stuff was in the Bible. And I thought to myself, like, I thought, well, how will that ever happen? Like, I, I thought I will never know where stuff is in the Bible or know what a particular book of the Bible is actually really about like these women do. And I thought to myself, you know, I think that would take a lifetime. And now I say, yeah, it does. But, you know, what else do you have that's so important in your life besides this word of God that will, the Bible says, you know, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. And so, yeah, it might take a lifetime to know the Bible, but it's the book that we say is the most important book in our life. And yet, I think for a lot of us, you know, if somebody says, what's the book of Titus about? Or what's the book of Hebrews about that we would go, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure. And so I'm hoping with my biblical theology workshops to just equip us to ha get a better sense of what this book is all about. You mentioned that some people will say, I love Jesus. And if you say, I love Jesus, you're going to want to know more about Jesus. Do you think that there is a culture in Christianity that loves the idea 
of Jesus, but isn't it to that point where it's like, but I really want to know him? Yeah. You, you know, if just think of it like of a relationship with a person. I mean, any person that we say we love, um, we're, we're driven to know them. And, and it's because we've invested some time and effort in knowing who they are and how they are and what's important to them. And, and, but at, so a lot of us might well say, yeah, I love Jesus. And it doesn't make sense then that, that we would say, but the Bible doesn't really interest me. And, and the truth is we probably wouldn't say it, but we say it with our actions when we ignore it. And, and so to me, the Bible and prayer is this mechanism that God has given to us so that we can know him. So we come to the Bible anticipating actually that he's going to talk to us and because it's his word and we want to know him. We want to understand what's his heartbeat. What, like, what's really important to him? Because if I love him, I want that to be important to me. But then we don't want it to be a one-way conversation where we're just hearing from him which is, I think sometimes the case, I don't know if it's like this for you, Therese, but like, you know, I can, I can read the Bible, but then I've got my prayer list, the stuff I want to talk to him about. (laughs) And so far better is that I would listen to what he has to say to me in his word, but then I want it to be a two-way conversation. So simply rather than turning away from the Bible to then just talk to him about what's important to me, instead, if I want to really have relationship with him, I stay in that word with that word open and I talk back to him about the things that are clearly important to him and make that then the the substance of my prayer. And that's how we develop a genuine love relationship with Christ. When there's something that's kind of amiss, I find that if I stop and I pray, open up the word, pray some more, put on some worship music, really begin to surrender my heart to God, so many of those things are suddenly not big things anymore. And it really isn't rocket science. Why is it so hard for us to do? I'm with you. Like, it sounds like the canned answer. And when you're having the, when you're having this heart to heart with someone, you hate to say something like, well, you know, have you opened your Bible to hear from him speak? Maybe you're feeling like he's far away from you. Is he really, you know, or is it that, you know, you haven't really been seeking to communicate to, with him. But, you know, I, I love this term. I don't know if you've ever heard it, Therese, the ordinary means of grace. And what the ordinary means of grace is, are these things of the preached word, the red word, prayer, the sacraments, fellowship with other believers. I mean, these very basic things And the fact that we call them the means of grace, these are the means by which we experience the grace of God in our lives. And the the flip side of that coin, I suppose, is that we can't really anticipate that we will experience the grace of God in our lives if we're ignoring all of those things. It's really rather basic, but we are all, we're just so bent to try to find the answers to our questions, the sense of, you know, resolving difficult situations, difficult feelings, experiences, relationships. We're always looking to the world to try to find answers and uh, soothe the pain of some of those things. And yet here we've been provided with this means of grace, the grace we desperately need in the midst of difficult circumstances. But really that's been happening since you know, creation. I mean, always looking for another, <laughs> let me just another find means, right? right the other way, the quick way, the, 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 my way of being able to make something happen. And we tend to always go toward that. Uh, if we could for a second, talk some about ladies studies, which I will be honest with you. I am not a fan of ladies studies, ladies conferences, ladies get to, because so often it is fluff I don't know. It just leaves my heart really, really empty. Why, why do, why do women like that? <laughs> why do women <laughs> like that? Why do, why do publishers keep making that? Why have we settled for that? Mm. Well, you've opened up a big old can of worms. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing I have to say is if you or any of you listeners are able to come to the biblical theology workshop I'm doing in Rochester on September 17th and 18th, I promise you, you're not going to think fluff, but at the same time, I can promise you, you're going to have fun because 
I think that sometimes, um, yeah, women's studies can be so emotionally driven. I mean, there's nothing I hate more than to go to a women's event and feel like I'm being manipulated emotionally. I mean, I think that's one reason sometimes we don't like them. Right. And this, yeah. And, and what you're saying that, that they actually think that it's more self-help that can help us with issues rather than to open up God's word and expect that he is going to speak. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes if you're, if your quest, going back to your question, why do I think that is, I'm not sure if you'll like this answer, Therese, but I think, I think oftentimes, um, first of all, women don't always expect that the Bible will meet their needs. And so maybe studies have learned to cater to that, that, that what women do want is to somehow be, you know, met emotionally. And like one way I always challenge women when they're leading a small group, I don't know if you've ever had this happen, Therese, where, you know, you're in a small group Bible study and somebody shows up and she's crying. So what do you do? What do you do? Like you, you, you don't want to ignore it because that seems like really mean and uncaring. Right. And so what I tell Bible study leaders is your temptation may be, and I know many, many women who have done this or would recommend this. It's like, okay, we've got to set the Bible aside for right now so that we can care for her. Right. And I just, I just say, no, 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 no. So you acknowledge, oh, we see that you're sad and we're going to be, have a time of prayer for the end. And we're going to pray for this, but you know, because we believe that the Bible is what we all came for and what we most need, we're going to trust that no matter what passage we are in today, that the Bible is going to speak to your deepest needs and meet whatever deep need it is you have right now. So, hey, everybody, let's open up the word and work through it. And at the end, we're going to pray for our sister so-and-so, you know, because I mean, hasn't that been your experience sometimes? Like you, something's really difficult in your life and you show up and you see what the sermon is about. And you think to yourself, like, this has nothing to do with what's going on in my life. But then it meets you. It speaks to you. And that's because the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And God uses his word to do a work in our life, which is what we desperately need. So I, I... I'm just done with women's studies that are going to be just, you know, emotional or whatever. And, you know, I've written a number of studies and it makes me so, so happy trees when I get a letter from someone and they say exactly what you said about women's studies. And like, I'd given up on this. I want someone to treat me like I have a brain. And when I found your studies, I did a series of five Old Testament studies called Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And they all send women really into the scriptures to see Christ in the whole of the scriptures. And so it just makes me deeply happy when I hear someone who says, you know, I was just done with that. I came and it helped me. And actually my experience was, I kept saying to myself, wow, I've never seen that before. You know, I, I think women have minds that they want to be making fresh discoveries in the scriptures about the person and work of Christ, not about their own psyche or emotions or experiences. And when that happens, that's when we get hooked on real Bible study. Can you tell me the first time you had one of those, oh, I didn't realize that about the Bible moments? Well, like one that comes to mind to me, I mean, I can see where I was sitting, you know, in church, we had a new pastor and he was talking. So, you know, most of my life, I grew up with an understanding of what the Christian life was all about would be, you know, I make a decision for Christ and I try really hard to live for him. And then I go to heaven when I die. And for most of my life, I never heard very much about the new heaven and the new earth, which by the way, this is why biblical theology is something that is so important to me because biblical theology, when we understand the story of the Bible, how God is working through history to actually bring us into the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, then we be begin to realize, wow, the way I understand my Christian life doesn't, it, it doesn't fit. There's something bigger happening here. That's really my life is all about. And so when I, when, when he just began to talk about a new heavens, and a new earth, and I began to think about that, the implications for me. Oh, so that made me realize, wow, I don't think I've ever thought through how and where my life is going to be and how it's going to be different when I die and my spirit goes to be with Christ and my body goes into the ground 
And then after Jesus returns and there's a resurrection and he resurrects my body, I had never thought through, Therese, well, then where is my life then? And what is my life then? Because then I'm going to be no longer spirit with Christ, body in the ground. I'm going to have a resurrected body that's fit for living forever on a resurrected, renewed earth. I'm going to be rejoined once again, body and soul. And I'm going to be body and soul in the presence of Christ on a resurrected earth. And honestly, I had just never thought of that before. You know, I just had this very flat, flat view of what happens. And honestly, Therese, that changes everything. That changes everything in terms of what I look forward to, what I long for. It changes everything about how I face death. It changes where my hope comes from or or the source of my hope. Like we talk a lot about, a, a lot about hope in the Christian life. And for most of my life, I would say my hope is, you know, I die and go to heaven. No, that's not my hope. I mean, I am hoping in that and have a firm confidence in that. But when you look at the Bible, the bi- hope is always centered on resurrection. It's focused on resurrection day because that is where the story of the Bible is headed. That's where everything that God has been at work in, on throughout history, this is where everything that was accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is headed. Not simply spirit with no body existence somewhere away from here, but body and soul in, in a resurrected, renewed body face to face with Christ with a community of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered around the throne of Christ in a new creation. That's where the story of the Bible is headed. That's where my personal life is headed. And that fills me with genuine, meaty, rigorous hope. You are a Bible teacher. Jesus spent a good part of his ministry teaching. What can we learn about how Jesus taught the Bible and how can we use that to teach other people the Bible or even to learn the Bible better? Well, I think one thing would be that Jesus always spoke of the Old Testament scriptures as being God's word, not just something Isaiah wrote, and you know, not something just Moses wrote. No, this is God's word. This is God speaking. And so he gives great authority to the scriptures. It's also fascinating to me that Jesus you know, he, what he, he didn't anticipate that everybody was going to receive his word. You know, there was a submission to God's sovereignty in terms of who would have ears to hear what he had to say. And I have to say that helps me as a Bible teacher, you know, I think early on, I just, you know, I felt this huge burden. It was all up to me to say it right and say it well, and, you know, say it, in a way that was compelling and answer everyone's question. And I want to do all of those things, but it helps me a lot to just rest in the fact that God's word accomplishes what God intends and that I can trust God's word to go to work in a person's life and that God will oversee that. And it's not all up to me. And that's a huge relief. It's almost like having a favorite child, but do you have a favorite book of the Bible? (laughs) <laughs> Are you allowed mm. to? I don't know. <laughs> well, I just finished writing a, a, a book, Therese, on the book of Revelation. So right now, I think the combination of the fact that, you know, I've been tracking and praying for some believers who didn't get out of Afghanistan and they're believers who have been very public with their faith. And, you know, I'm just talking about in the last few days, like the in- interactions and the Taliban is after them. And that reality, when I live in total freedom, it's really helping me having just been through Revelation, like, especially like you get to, I think it's Revelation six, where, you know, you've got these early martyrs for Christ and they are being protected underneath the throne, but they're crying out to God, how long, how long until you take care of those who have harmed us and do what's right. And the answer they get is actually a huge gulp, Therese, because the answer is a little while longer until the full number come in. And to know that God has all, it's always been part of his mysterious plan that there will be those who face death 
over their commitment to him. And that's not just something that happened in the first century. And it's, it's not something that's just happened at certain points in our history. It's happening right now. Knowing that has been a part of my praying for them. It's, it, it's opened my eyes, I think, in my comfortable, you know, yes, we're going through difficult times in America, but we're not facing being hunted down, right, to perhaps be executed solely because we say that Jesus is Lord. And so, you know, the Bible helps us with very real things. You know, the, the Psalms have helped me as I have prayed, even praying in precatory prayers for the evildoers and bloodthirsty men, which I read about in Psalm 57, as I formulated a, pr- a prayer for them, those kinds of things. I mean, so the Bible speaks to real life. So I'm, I, I'm currently uh, really focused on, on revelation, but, um, if you ask me, my favorite might be Genesis and it's the two of them together, you know, that form this bookend. You can't understand revelation without Genesis and you can't really make any sense or have any hope that all of the things that are presented to us in Genesis, the story that begins there is actually going to come to its full fruition, its full resolution until you get to the book of Revelation. So for example, in Genesis, you've got this tree of life in the garden in in, in chapter two. And then in Revelation 22, the last book of the Bible, once again, there we see the tree of life, except now it's on both sides of the river. And there's not just one kind of fruit, there's 12 kinds of fruit. And then not just one crop of fruit, a season, but a, a new crop of fruit every month. And of course, that's that symbolic language is speaking to us about the abundant of the greater garden, or what I like to call Eden 2.0, when we finally enter this far greater garden, where we're, we're not going to be have the potential of falling into sin. Revelation 21 says nothing evil will ever enter it. Revelation 22, 3 says nothing, no longer will anything be accursed. That curse that came into the first garden is going to be gone for good when we enter into the new garden. And so to see how the Bible puts both of, puts these things together in a complete story, you know, that's what, that's where my love of biblical theology comes. It's funny that you mentioned Afghanistan. I was going to bring it up, but I wasn't going to, um, I would just happen to be in Romans 12 that day. And as, as you hear this scripture and, and, you know, there's Paul in this place and he says, bless those that persecute you. And I was like, whoa, back, whoa, back. And I had to go back and listen again and again, and really just say, God, am I supposed to pray for people, terrorists who are persecuting Christians right now today. Those people will not come to salvation unless there's intervention from people who believe the gospel. It's hard. Maybe part of it is that we just think, well, that's impossible. Right. (laughs) Right. But that's not how God works. You know, (laughs) I wrote a book that came out last year called Saints and Scoundrels in the Story of Jesus. Hmm. And one of the scoundrels was... Paul. Right. I mean, when you really I mean, look at Paul, you're right? like, I would hate him. Like, I would hate him. And I started the chapter asking the question, you know, who, who is the last person you think will ever become a Christian? Because I think in the first century, if you had asked who, in, you know, anyone in the church, who's the last person you think will become a Christian, they would say Saul of Tarsus. That guy. Right. Yeah. And why? Because he was doing exactly what the Taliban is doing in regard to my friends right, right. now. I mean, he was, he he'd got, he had the letters mm-hmm. of permission. He was headed to Damascus and he was going to go house to house. Right. He was going to bring people back in chains. And if they died along the way, well, no, no, right. no, no problem to him. And, and so, I mean, and, and what happened? God right. revealed, Christ revealed himself to him. He actually saw the risen Christ on that road to Damascus. And he repented of his sin and he put his faith in Christ and it can happen. And so, yeah, we, we pray for that. We pray for protection for those we love. We pray for evil to be dealt with. And we, we trust in knowing that God will deal with that. But I guess here's the humbling thing for me, Therese. I realized, you know, I was at once an enemy with God. And I deserved nothing less than any enemy of God deserves. And then we read in in Romans 10 that when we were enemies with God, that he 
died for us and he brought us to himself and he's made us now his friends. And that is a miracle of grace that we don't deserve. You can find out more about Nancy Guthrie, her upcoming workshops, and the book she's written at nancyguthrie.com. On our next episode, Nancy will share about the profound loss of two of her children as infants and what God revealed about grief. If you or someone you know is struggling, be sure to download episode 39 on Tuesday morning. Did you enjoy this episode of Therese Talk? Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And if you really loved it, consider making a gift of family life, the ministry, this podcast, is a part of. Just go to familylife.org and find out more about what we do. Did you know Family Life offers a variety of podcasts? There's family programming with Family Life Kids, the latest issues with Family Life News, our newest podcast, The Sunny Side, filled with real life stories of God's goodness. And if that makes sense, a Family Life original podcast where they talk about what life is really like as a Christian in your 20s. They're all free and on demand at familylife.org slash podcast. I'm not the only